something terrible had happened. So when the officers arrived, Herb Clutter was sprawled on a mattress in the basement. He had been stabbed and his throat had been slashed and a bullet wound was in his head. He was wearing pajamas, his hands were bound, and his mouth was sh taped shut. On a couch in an adjoining room was a 15-year-old Kenyan clutter who was bound, gagged, and shot in the head. And in a separate upstairs bedroom, in two separate bedrooms, were the bodies of Bonnie Clutter and Nancy Clutter. Bonnie Clutter was bound and gagged, and Nancy was only bound. Each had been shot in the head.
synapses were firing there for a moment. Um, they were still driving the stolen car, which had the Kansas license plate on it, and the authorities had like an all points bulletin out for these men. able to read all of their letters and so 
milk pails and the whispery chatter of the boys who brought them. Two sons of a hired man named Vic Earsick usually roused him, but today he lingered, let Vic Earsick's sons come and leave for the previous evening. resurrected her old self as if serving up a preview of the normality the regained vigor soon to be. She had rouged her lips, fussed with her hair, and wearing a new dress, accompanied him to the Holcomb School, where they applauded a student production of Tom Sawyer, in which Nancy played Becky Thatcher. He had enjoyed seeing Bonnie out in public, nervous, but nonetheless smiling, talking to people, and they both had been proud of Nancy. She had done so well remembering all her lines and looking, as he had said to her, in the course of backstage congratulations, just a beautiful honey, a real southern belle. Whereupon Nancy had behaved like one, curtsying in her hoop-skirted costume, she had asked if she might drive to into Garden City. The State Theater was having a special 11.30, Friday the 13th, spook show, and all her friends were going. In other circumstances, Mr. Clutter would have refused. His laws were laws, and one of them was Nancy and Kenyon do must be home by 10 on weeknights, and by 12 on Saturday. But weakened by the genial events of the evening, he had consented, and Nancy had not returned home until almost due. He had heard her come in, had called to her, for though he not a man ever really to raise his voice, he had some plain things to say to her, statements that concerned less the lateness of the hour than the youngster who had driven her home. A school basketball hero, Bobby Rupp. Mr. Clutter liked Bobby and considered him for his for a boy his age, which was seventeen. Most dependable and gentlemanly, however, in three years she had been permitted dates. Nancy, popular and pretty as she was, had never gone out with anyone else. And while Clutter understood that it was present national adolescent custom to form couples and to go steady and wear engagement rings. He disapproved particularly, since he had not long by accident surprised his daughter and the rough boy kissing. He had then suggested that Nancy discontinue seeing so much of Bobby, advising her that a slow retreat now would hurt an abrupt severance later. For as he reminded her, it was parting that must eventually take place. The Rupps were Roman Catholic, the Clutters Methodist, a fact that should in itself be sufficient to determine whatever fancies she and this boy might have of someday marrying. Nancy had been reasonable. At any rate, she had not argued secured from her a promise to begin a gradual breaking off with Bobby. Still, the incident had lamentably put off his retiring time, which was ordinarily eleven o'clock. As a consequence, it was well after seven when he awakened on Saturday, November 14, 1959. His wife always slept as late as possible, However, while Mr. Clutter was shaving, showering, and outfitting himself in whipcord trousers, a cattleman's leather jacket, and soft stirrup boots, he had no fear of disturbing her. They did not share the same bedroom. For several years, he had slept alone in the master bedroom on the ground floor of the house, a two-story, fourteen-room frame and brick structure. Though Mrs. Clutter stored her clothes in the closets of 
much like Nancy and Kenyon's room was on the second floor. The house, for the most part, designed by Mr. Clutter, who thereby proved himself a sensible and sedate, if not notably decorative architect, had been built in 1942 for $40,000. The resale value was now $60,000. Situated at the end of a long lane-like drive 
enthusiasm and the educated instruction of a likable young fellow who seemed to know his business. All the same, he was not doing what he wanted to do. The son of a farmer, he had from the beginning aimed at operating a property of his own. Facing up to it, he resigned as county agent after four years and on land leased with borrowed money created in Embryo River Valley Farm, a name justified by the Arkansas River, meandering presence but not certainly by any evidence of a valley. It was an endeavor that several Finney County conservatives watched with show us amusement. Old timers who had been fond of baiting the useful county agent on the subject of his university notions. That's fine, or you always know what's best to do on the other fellow's land. Plant this, terrace that, but you might say a sight different if the place was your own. They were mistaken. Upstart's experiments succeeded, partly because in the beginning years he labored 18 hours a day. Setbacks occurred, twice the wheat crop failed, and one winter he lost several hundred head of sheep in a blizzard. But after a decade, Mr. Clutter's domain consisted of over 800 acres owned outright, and 3,000 more worked on a rental basis. And that, as his colleagues admitted, was a pretty good spread. Wheat, maize seed, certified grass seed, these were the crops the farm's prosperity depended upon. Animals were also important, sheep and especially cattle, a herd of several hundred, here for airport stalker cattle before the clutter brand. One would not have suspected it from the scant contents of the livestock corral, which was reserved for ailing steers, a few milking cows, Nancy's cats, and Babe, the family favorite, an old fat workhorse who never objected to lumbering about with three and four children astride or broad back. Okay, I don't know if you're even still with me, but I'm going to fast forward to when we're introduced to the murderers, um, Hickok and Smith. And I probably won't read for much longer, but let me know what you think in the comments. Like Mr. Clutter, the young man breakfasting in the cafe called the Little Jewel never drank coffee. He preferred root beer, three aspirin, cold root beer, and a chain of Pall Mall cigarettes. That was his notion of a proper chow down. Sipping and smoking, he studied a map, spread it on the counter before him, a Phillips 66 map of Mexico. But it was difficult to concentrate, for he was expecting a friend, and the friend was late. He looked out a window at the silent small town street a street he had never seen until yesterday. Still no sign of Dick, but he was sure to show up. After all, the purpose of their meeting was Dick's idea, his score, and when it was settled, Mexico. The map was ragged, so thumbed that it had grown as supple as a piece of chamois. Around the corner, in his room at the hotel where he was staying, were hundreds more like it. Worn maps of every state in the Union, every Canadian province, every South American country, for the young man was an incessant conveyor, sorry, conceiver of 